Thus, if I heard on one occasion, the Blessed One was wandering in the Magadhan country and eventually arrived at Rajagaha. There he went to the potter Bhagava and said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, Bhagava, I will stay one night at, in your workshop. It is not inconvenient for me, venerable sir, but there is a homeless one already staying there. If he agrees, then stay as long as you like, venerable sir. You want that sound? Okay. Now there was a clansman named Pukusati who had gone forth from the home life into homelessness out of faith in the Blessed One. On that occasion, he was already staying in the potter's workshop. Then the Blessed One went to the Venerable uh, Pukusati and said to him, if it is not inconvenient for you, monk, I will stay one night in the workshop. The potter's workshop is large enough, friend. Let the venerable one stay as long as he likes. Now, Pukusati was a king of one of the places that was fairly far away. And he met King Bimbisara who was the, the, the king of uh, Magadha. And <clears throat> they became friends and got interested. He, uh, he got interested in talking Dhamma with King Bimbisara. And then when he left and went home, they started communicating, writing letters and things like that. Now, King Bimbisara, he was very, very devoted to the Buddha. And when he was writing words that the Buddha said, he was writing it down on a gold, gold tablet. And then he would send it to Pukusati. Pukusati became so in, in enthralled with the Buddha's teaching that he gave up his kingdom and started traveling to meet the Buddha. And that's when this is taking place. <clears throat> then the Blessed One entered the potter's workshop, prepared a spread of grass at one end and sat down, folding his legs crosswise, setting his body erect and established mindfulness in front of him. Then the Blessed One spent most of the night seated in meditation. And the Venerable Pukusati also spent most of the night seated in meditation. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman conducts himself in a way that inspires confidence. Suppose I were to question him. So he asked the venter venerable Pukusati, under whom have you gone forth, monk? Who is your teacher? Whose Dhamma do you profess? Friend, there is the recluse Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan. Now a good report of that blessed uh, Gotama has been spread to this effect. That blessed one is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct. Sublime knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed. Teacher of gods and humans, awakened and blessed. I have gone forth under the Blessed One. That Blessed One is my teacher. I profess the Dhamma of that Blessed One. But monk, 
Where is the Blessed One accomplished and fully awakened now living? There is, friend, a city in the northern country named Sawati. The Blessed One accomplished and fully awakened is now living there. But monk, have you ever seen the Blessed One before? Would you recognize him if you saw him? No, friend, I've never seen the Blessed One before, nor would I recognize him if I saw him. Then the Blessed One thought, this clansman has gone forth from the home life into homelessness under me. Suppose I were to teach him the Dhamma. So the Blessed One addressed the Venerable Pukusati thus, Monk, I will teach you the Dhamma. Listen and attend closely to what I shall say. Yes, friend, the Venerable Pukusati replied. The Blessed One said this, Monk, this person consists of six elements, six bases of contact, 18 kinds of mental exploration, and he has four foundations. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. When the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he is called a sage at peace. One should not neglect wisdom, should pre preserve the truth, should cultivate relinquishment and should train for peace. This is the summary of the exposition of the six elements. Monk, this person consists of six elements, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said. There are the earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, and the consciousness element. So it is with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person consists of six elements. Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact, so it was said, and with reference to what was this said, there are the base of eye contact, the base of ear contact, the base of nose contact, the base of tongue contact, the base of body contact, and the base of mind contact. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person consists of six bases of contact. Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, on seeing a form with the eye, one experiences a form productive of joy. One experiences a form productive of grief. One experiences a form productive of equanimity. On hearing a sound with the ear, one experiences a form productive of joy. One, ex one explores a form productive of grief. One explores a form productive of equanimity. On smelling an odor with the nose, on tasting a flavor with the tongue, on touching a tangible with the body, on cognizing a mind object with mind, one explores a mind object productive of joy. One explores a mind object productive of grief. One explores a mind object productive of equanimity. So it was with reference to this that it was said, Monk, this person consists of 18 kinds of mental exploration. Monk, this person has four foundations. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, 
there are the foundation of wisdom, the foundation of truth, the foundation of relinquishment. Now relinquishment here is actually referring to the impersonal nature of everything, giving up the idea that this is a self, this is me, this is mine. The foundation of peace. So it was with reference that it, to this that it was said, monks, this person has four foundations. One should not neglect wisdom. One should preserve truth. One should cultivate relinquishment, disenchantment, dispassion, same thing. And should train for peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, how, monks, does one not neglect wisdom? There are these six elements, the earth element, water element, fire element, air element, space element, and consciousness element. What monk is the earth element? The earth element may be either internal or external. What is the internal earth element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. That is, head hairs, body hairs, nails, teeth, skin, flesh, sinew, bones, bone marrow, kidneys, heart, liver, diaphragm, spleen, lungs, intestines, mesentery, contents of the stomach, feces, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is solid, solidified, and clung to. This is called the internal earth element. Now both the internal earth element and the external earth element are simply earth element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. Anytime you hear the word wisdom, it is talking about how the links of dependent origination work. This is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. So seeing all the different aspects of the earth element as being part of an impersonal process. It's not you. When I was teaching in <clears throat> Malaysia, I was teaching a lot of college students. And they were 20, 21, 22, and they're just starting to feel their hormones. So they, they had a lot of lust arising while they were doing the meditation. They asked, how can I overcome this lust? So I told them very simply that Anytime you see a, a beautiful body and you feel attracted to it, turn it inside out and tell me what's attractive about that. You have a lovely stomach. Oh, your intestines are wonderful. I really like your liver. When you start looking at the body in that way, all of a sudden you start losing the lustful feelings. Because there's really nothing beautiful about a body. And you'll get more of that in just a moment. When one sees as it actually is, one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the earth element and makes a mind of dispassion. I, I keep on, I gotta change that. You don't make the mind, you observe the mind's dispassion towards the earth element. 
See, the, the, that word makes implies that you have something to do with it. And it means that you're personally taking that. But when it just observes how this, these things all fit together, how they work, and you start seeing them as an impersonal process, then your mind becomes disenchanted. And it's, it, it, it kind of turns into a ho-hum, everybody is the same. And there's no excitement in your mind. Disenchantment is a much more subtle form of equanimity. Where there's no excitement in your mind arising at all. And dispassion is even subtler form of equanimity. Yeah, it's there, so. And there's no, uh, no passionate holding on to of the earth element. What monk is the water element. The water element may either be internal or external. What is the internal water element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to. That is bile, phlegm, pus, blood, sweat, fat, tears, grease, spittle, snot, oil of the joints, or urine. So you see a beautiful body and you know that it has pus and blood and bile, oil of the joints. There's nothing beautiful about that. What, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is water, watery and clung to. This is called the internal water element. Now both the internal water element and the external water element are simply water element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the water element and makes the mind dispassionate and observes the mind become dispassionate towards the water element. What monks is the fire element? The fire element may be either internal or external. What is the internal fire element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. That is, that by which one is warmed, ages, and is consumed. And that by which what was eaten, drunk, and consumed and tasted gets completely digested or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is fire, fiery and clung to. This is called the internal fire element. Oh, I forgot to tell you. The, the thing with the water element is you can't feel the water. Put your hand in a bucket of water and tell me what you feel. You feel hot or cold. You don't feel water. Just kind of a little interesting thing that I found on my own. Now, both the internal fire element and the external fire element are simply fire element. 
And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom. Thus, this is not mine. This I am not. This is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes disenchanted with the fire element and observes how the mind becomes dispassionate towards the fire element. What, monks, is the air element? The air element may either be internal or external. What is the internal air element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. That is upgoing winds, downgoing winds, winds in the bow, uh, belly, winds in the bowels, winds that course through the limbs, in breath and out breath, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is air, airy and clung to. This is called the internal element, air element. Now, both the internal air element and the external air element are simply air element. <coughs> Excuse me. And what should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. This is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes dischanted with the air element and observes how the mind becomes dispassionate towards the air element. What, monks, is the space element? The space element may be either internal or external. What is the internal space element? Whatever internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial and clung to. That is the holes of the ears, the nostrils, the door of the mouth, and that aperture whereby what is eaten, drunk, consumed, and tasted gets swallowed. <coughs> where it collects and whereby it is excreted from below, or whatever else internally belonging to oneself is space, spatial, and clung to. This is called the internal space element. Now both the internal space element and the external space element are simply space element. And that should be seen as it actually is with proper wisdom thus. <clears throat> this is not mine, this I am not, this is not myself. When one sees it thus as it actually is with proper wisdom, one becomes dischanted with the space element and observes how the mind becomes dispassionate towards the space element. Then there remains only consciousness, purified and bright. What does one cognize with that consciousness? Cognize, what does cognize mean? No? Uh, what does recognize mean? Rec remember. Yeah, you remember. Okay. But cognize is just to observe. Okay, you don't recognize. You cognize, so you're seeing things, how they work in the present. What does one cognize with that consciousness? One cognizes this is pleasant. One cognizes this is painful. 
one cognizes this is neither painful nor pleasant. It depends on a contact to be felt as pleasant. There arises a pleasant feeling. Okay, so what we're talking about here is perception. That's the thing that gives it the name. When a pleasant feeling arises, you recognize it as a pleasant feeling, and that's part of perception. It also has memory in it. One understands, I feel a pleasant feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as pleasant, its corresponding feeling, the pleasant feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as pleasant, ceases and subsides. Independence on contact to be felt as a painful, there arises a painful feeling. When one feels a painful feeling, one understands I feel a painful feeling. One understands with the cessation of that same contact to be felt as painful, its corresponding feeling, the painful feeling that arose in dependence on that contact to be felt as painful, ceases and subsides. Now the whole thing with this is, <coughs> you have a feeling arise. Feeling is pleasant or painful, neither painful nor pleasant. Right after that, craving arises. Craving is that tightness around your brain or in your brain. And it is the I like it if it's a, pain, a pleasant feeling. It's I don't like it if it's a painful feeling. That's the very beginning of the false belief in a personal self. So when you recognize that there's this tension and tightness in your head and you relax, your mind becomes very clear, very alert, very bright, but there's no thoughts to cloud your mind. There's no opinion, there's no ideas, there's only this clear observation. Then you bring that clear observation back to <clears throat> back to something wholesome. What's wholesome? Smile. And bring that smiling mind back to your object of meditation. When you do that, your mind becomes very pure. Why? Because you've let go of craving and you don't have anything distracting you away from seeing how this process works. And this is why this is immediately effective. So, using the six R's in this way, is the way you purify your mind. And the more purified your mind becomes, the more balance you have in your mind. You start letting go of emotional states that used to get you angry, get you upset or fearful, or sad, whatever it, the catch of the day happened to be. So when you let go of the craving, you're purifying your mind. And you're bringing that pure, happy mind back to your object of meditation. This is why you start progressing more and more more quickly because you start understanding the importance of using the six R's. Very important indeed. 
Now, people that practice one-pointed concentration or absorption concentration, they sometimes call it, and people that practice straight vipassana are practicing a one-pointed kind of concentration. Why do I say that? Because they don't see craving and they aren't able to let it go. They aren't able to relax into that and purify their mind. So what happens is something comes up in mind and then you start noting it. Thinking, 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 thinking until it goes away and immediately come back to your primary object of meditation. <clears throat> but when you do that, you're bringing the craving back to your object of meditation. And that's why that is a one-pointed kind of concentration. You get to what they call access concentration, or they call it uh, neighborhood concentration. Now this is when the force of the concentration is just strong enough that the concentration suppresses the hindrances. And from what I was telling you last night, the hindrances are a very necessary part of your practice. They're showing you where your attachments are. But now, because you practice one-pointed concentration, you don't see that. You don't recognize that. And that takes you off of the path that the Buddha taught. So it's very important to understand that you need to have the six R's and use them very often. Recognize that your mind is distracted. Release the distraction. Don't keep your attention on that distraction. It doesn't matter whether it's a feeling or thoughts or sensations. It just doesn't matter. Don't keep your attention on it. Now you relax the tightness caused by that mind's movement. Bring up something wholesome. Smile. Have a light mind. Now when I was practicing in Burma for so long, I got to places where I would have a lot of joy arise. That does happen even, even in one-pointed concentration. It does arise. And I'd go to the teacher and the first thing he'd, see, he'd hear me say something about, oh, this is really good. I like this meditation. I have a lot of joy. And the first thing he'd say is, don't get attached. Well, I certainly didn't want to get attached. I didn't understand what attached meant because they never explained it to me. But I started pushing the joy away. No, nope. don't want that. Well, that's wrong practice. <coughs> See, the thing is, a pleasant feeling and a painful feeling. Same coin, different sides. You treat them both in the same way. If you see that your mind is getting caught up in liking that joyful feeling, then you six R and allow it to be there by itself. That doesn't mean it'll go away necessarily, but you don't keep your attention on it. And then you relax and you bring that, that joyful feeling, if it's still there, back to smiling. Now, one of the advantages of smiling is it improves your mindfulness. <coughs> you get to see more and more clearly how mind, it can have joy in it, and all of a sudden a negative thought comes in and it just starts sinking. Mind starts sinking away. 
Now, if you get into the habit of smiling more, you'll catch that more quickly and you'll be able to relax into that and let it go. So I don't care what you're doing. I don't care if you have a job that you have to do. You gotta smile. The more you smile, the easier your meditation becomes. Now, I've had some students that went to some teachers of different kinds of meditation and after they did a retreat with me, they would be sitting and they'd smile in the med while they were doing their meditation. And the teachers there got angry at them and told them they had to leave if they were gonna continue smiling. And they kicked some people out of the retreat because they were smiling. Well, meditation is supposed to be serious. Okay, make it seriously happy. Don't give up the smile. Keep the smile going. It's necessary. Your mind becomes much more alert. And it's easier to catch small distractions when you're smiling. And then you can 6R very easily and let it be. Not get caught up in a hindrance. <coughs> so, the more you can practice smiling with your daily activities, the better your sitting is going to become. You're washing your face, you're washing your body, taking a shower, smile. You're eating, you're going to the bathroom, smile. You have some job that you have to do to take care of and clean, up, clean your cabin and that sort of thing. Smile while you're doing it. Stay with your spiritual friend as much as you can remember to, or I should say your object of meditation. Okay. Monk, just as from the contact and friction of two fire sticks, heat it's generated. Heat at two fire sticks, heat is generated, and the and as fire is produced, with the separation and disjunction of these two fire sticks, the corresponding heat ceases and subsides. So too, independence on contact to be felt as pleasant, to be felt as painful, to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant. There arises neither painful nor pleasant feelings. One understands with the cessation of that contact to be felt as neither painful nor pleasant, its corresponding feeling ceases and subsides. Don't keep your attention on it. Let it go. As soon as you get to that relaxed step, your mind becomes pure. <clears throat> One of the interesting things about the choice of translation. Uh, the translator call anatta, not self. And that's so confusing to people these days. It's really pretty amazing. Well, you have to develop yourself before you can see not self. Well, that's ridiculous. They don't know what it is. That's why I choose the words if you take something personally, you're identifying with it, you're caught in craving. 
And when you let go of that craving, you start to see the impersonal nature, the not-self nature. But you're still very aware, you're more aware than ever before. And it gets to be um, clearer and clearer as you see this more often. Then there remains only equanimity, purified and bright, malleable, wieldy and radiant. Suppose a monk, a skilled goldsmith, suppose monk, a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice were to prepare a furnace, heat up the crucible and take some gold with tongs and put them in the crucible. From time to time he would blow on it. From time to time he would sprinkle water over it. From time to time he would just look on. That gold would become refined, well refined, completely refined, faultless, rid of dross, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. When whatever kind of ornament he wishes to make, whether a gold chain or earrings or necklace or a gold garland, it would serve his purpose. So too, monk, then there remains only equanimity, purified, bright, malleable, wieldy, and radiant. <clears throat> so every time you let go of a distraction, your mind becomes closer and closer to this kind of equanimity. With the loving kindness meditation, you will be able to get to the fourth jhana, where, so you get into the first jhana, and that's a major step. When you get into the fourth jhana, that's the next major step. And your mind does become <clears throat> full of equanimity, strong balance. And after that, then you go get into the immaterial realms, the mental realms. And you experience the arupa jhanas. Now, I know that there's an awful lot of teachers out there that they're afraid of the jhanas, but it's not the same kind of jhana that you're practicing here. There's <coughs> cases of people practicing one-pointed concentration or absorption concentration and actually going crazy because they don't understand how they're supposed to be doing it and the teacher they have is not teaching them well. There was a girl in Sri Lanka that she'd been teaching yoga for 10 years and she was holding on to a lot of that concentration and she very, came very close to having to go to a mental institute. When we found her and started talking to her, we got her to change her lifestyle around. And she was starving herself because she was such a strict vegetarian that she just wasn't getting the proper nutrition that she needed. So we got that straightened out, and then we started teaching her how to use the six R's. Now for 10 years, she hadn't cut her hair, and she had dreadlocks. And that was pulling on her scalp all the time, the, just the weight of the hair. So we told her she had to get a haircut. And as soon as she did that, she started feeling relief all through her head. 
but for 10 years, it, she just it never noticed it. After a period of time, she came and listened to one of the talks that I gave the first time, the second time I went to Sri Lanka. When I was at, the, at a university get, talking to the teachers and students there, and she heard me talk about how important it is to smile. And she started doing it, and she got much lighter in her mind. And then when she was sitting in meditation, she actually started progressing properly. The last time I saw her, in one 10-day retreat, she went from uh, being in the fourth jhana to becoming a Sakadagami with fruition. So <clears throat> now she has no questions about meditation at all. And she has no question about she still teaches yoga, but now she's teaching people to smile while they're doing their stretching and relaxing their mind while they're doing their stretching. As a re result, they're much, much more flexible, much quicker, because of using the six R's and smiling, relaxing the tightness and the, the trying to make their body get in a pretzel and that sort of thing. So that, that got her from, oh, she was really in bad shape. I mean, she was seeing oh, horrible ghosts and this kind of thing and she was really off balance and thinking that it was a good thing, that she's very spiritual. And that kind of thing is not being spiritual. That's getting into wrong concentration when that starts to happen. <coughs> okay. So the six R's, when you practice the six R's, you will never have that sort of thing happen. You won't get out of balance. You always get more and more in balance. The people that practice one-pointed concentration, they are so focused on just one thing that there is not any personality development when they get out of that concentration. But when you're practicing what I'm showing you right now, there is personality development. <clears throat> he understands thus, if I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to the base of loving kindness with infinite space, and to develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by loving kindness and the base of infinite space and clinging to it would remain for a long time. I don't like the word clinging to it. That implies thinking about it. And this is not a thinking about kind of meditation. If I were to direct this equanimity so purified and bright to joy and the base of infinite consciousness, or if I were to direct my mind to a strong equanimity and the realm of nothingness, or to the base of neither perception nor non-perception and develop my mind accordingly, then this equanimity of mind supported by that base would remain for a very long time. 
That's why I say when your meditation is good, don't break your sitting. I don't care if this, the lunch bell rang. Don't break your sitting when you have a good sitting. Now, this, I uh, had a rather extraordinary experience the last time I was in Indonesia. And there was a man that came and he'd never meditated before. And he followed the directions very, very well. He came in for the first interview and I said, how long have you sat? And did you sit? Your best sitting? He said, four hours. Now this is the first time he'd ever done any meditation and this is the first day of the retreat and he's sitting for four hours. And he, he was moving right along with his, with his practice. So the next day he came in and his face was kind of shiny. And I said, uh, how long did you sit? And he said, 11 and a half hours. Wow. What time did you start sitting? I got up at 2 o'clock, started sitting at 2 o'clock. When he came for his interview, it was like four o'clock in the afternoon. He got up at two o'clock in the morning. And he'd gone through all of the jhanas and he was going through the arupa jhanas very quickly. The next day he sat for 12 hours. And he had become a sotapanna. Now this is three days into a retreat. It's pretty impressive that somebody does it that quick. I'm not used to that quite. I'm used to people coming for a retreat on the second or third day, they can get into the fourth jhana. Yeah, okay, after two or three days, but to carry it on and become a sotapanna in two or three days is just rather extraordinary. It just doesn't happen that much. So when you stay with your object of meditation and six are any slight distraction that starts to arise, then your mind becomes more pure and you'll be able to sit for longer periods of time. And <clears throat> when people get to a certain level, like start pushing them to sit longer. Why don't you sit for two hours instead of an hour and a half? Why don't you sit for three hours? Four is better. But when you get up from your sitting, when you're at this stage, what I want you to do is reflect on what happened while you were in that sitting. And any kind of little thought or disturbance or vibration or color or pattern or whatever it happens to be, you need to 6R that. And then when you get up, I want you to walk very quickly and breathe through your mouth. Walk that fast that you're breathing through your mouth. Going up and down stairs very quickly is a good thing because it gets your blood circulating and that way the next time you sit, your meditation is going to be very good. Again, you need to have some water bottles close by and drink water while you're sitting like this. It takes a lot of energy to sit like this and your blood starts to settle in your body. And if you drink some water, that'll help loosen it up and get the circulation going again. 
that an exercise. Now, when I was in Burma, the first day of a retreat with this particular teacher, I walked in, I was doing straight vipassana. And he said, uh, how long did you sit? I said, I sat for an hour, walk for an hour, standard. And the second day I came in, he said, how, uh, oh, he said, uh, before that, he said, why don't you sit longer? I said, okay, I can do that. So the second day I came in, he said, how long did you sit? I said, I sat for two hours, walk for an hour. He said, good, why don't you sit longer? Said, yeah, okay, I can do that. Next day I came in, sat for three hours. Why don't you sit longer? Mm. After three hours sit with Vipassana, you start to have pains arise in the body. They're meditation pains, but they're real intense. So the next day I came in and I was not very happy. How long did you sit? four hours. It was a killer. The pain was so intense, it was just unbelievable. And he said, uh, did you move while you were sitting? I said, yeah, it was painful. I couldn't stand it. He said, well, don't move. Ah, uh, okay. And the next day I came in, how long did you sit? Four hours, it was a killer, I never want to do that again. And he said, why don't you sit longer? I said, no, that's plenty long. But after a while he kept after me and I got up to six hours or eight hours, something like that. But the kind of walking they had us doing was super slow. So I didn't get any exercise. And you notice I have trouble walking and my ankles get real swollen. Guess what? It's because of that. So I want to make sure that you get enough exercise. Get your heart pumping real nice. Start breathing through your mouth. The longer you sit, the more you need the exercise. Okay? It is important. Now, a lot of people have this idea that uh, walking is not meditation. And it absolutely is. What are you doing with your mind? Staying with your object of meditation. And you can, you can be in the realm of nothingness. And you can get up and start walking and stay in the realm of nothingness while you're doing your walking meditation. Then you come back and sit down and start all over again. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels a painful feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There's no holding to it. There's no delight in it. If he feels a neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he understands it is impermanent. There is no holding to it. There is no delight in it. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels detached. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels detached. If he feels another, neither painful nor pleasant feeling, he feels detached. Detached, that's an interesting word. What does that mean? Yeah, not, not holding on to it. 
you have some distance. Now, one of the the things that a lot of straight vipassana teachers talk about is impermanence, suffering, and not self. But they don't really understand what they're saying. Oh, everything is impermanent. Well, there are levels of understanding when you do that. When you start focusing on everything being impermanent, suffering, and not self, you'll only go to a surface level. When you start understanding how this process actually works and how the links of dependent origination arise, you start seeing in each link there is impermanence, suffering, and the impersonal nature in each link of the 12 links of dependent origination. That was probably, oh, somewhere around 100,000 arising and passing away of dependent origination. So when you're able to see these links, we're talking about really going deep and very subtle and very alert mind. Can that happen for you in this retreat? Yes. Can you go further than that in this retreat? Yes. If you follow the directions and do follow the suggestions that are made. Smile. Don't get caught in oh, your hindrances and your nonsense, rubbish thoughts and that sort of thing. Practice your six R's to a very fine degree. The six R's will take you all the way to Nibbana. And it will take you all the way to Arahatship. So it's a, a very necessary type of practice that you need to be doing. Let's see. If he feels a pleasant feeling, he feels it, it detached. If he feels a painful feeling, he feels it detached. If he feels a neither pleasant nor painful feeling, he feels it detached. When he feels a feeling terminating with the body, he understands I feel a feeling terminating with the body. Now, when you get up into the Arupa Jhanas, you don't have a body. It's all a mental realm. It might feel like you have a body. You might feel a pain coming up that's right there or wherever, but that's actually a mental pain and it is a meditation pain. The difference between meditation pain and real pain, real pain, you have a pain here, it doesn't go away. After you get up and start moving around, that pain stays. Don't sit in that posture that makes you hurt your body. Meditation pain, the pain is just as real as a real pain. But as soon as you get up and start walking a little bit, you forget you even had that pain. That's a meditation pain. It goes away by itself. And that is mental pain, not physical pain. <clears throat> he understands on the dissolution of the body with the ending of life all that is felt not being delighted in will become cool right there or right here 
And what happens is your radiance and heat start dissipating when you get to the end of your life. And you can feel this. I've been with some people that have been um, meditators for many years. And they were successful with their meditation. And they were dying and I would ask them, what's happening with your body? Oh, I don't feel, uh, it, my, my feet are cold and now I don't feel my feet anymore. And then up, up the shin and then the knee and you, 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 they can just feel the heat dissipating as they uh, experience death. Monk, just as an oil lamp burns independence on oil and a wick, and when the oil and wick are used up, if it does not get any more fuel, it is extinguished from lack of fuel. And that's what happens. The heat and vitality just start dissipating and going away. And an interesting thing is if you're with somebody that dies or has just died, if you put your hand over their uh, crown of their head, you can feel the energy leaving the body, They're just coming out. And it'll do that for a period of time, maybe, oh, an hour, hour and a half, two hours like that. It's a real interesting phenomena. On the dissolution of the body with the ending of all life, all that is felt, not being delighted in, will become cool right here. And that's what happens. Therefore, a monk possessing this wisdom possesses the supreme foundation of wisdom. For this monk is the supreme noble wisdom, namely the knowledge of the destruction of all suffering. His deliverance being founded upon truth is unshakable. For that is false monk, which has a deceptive nature, and that is true, which has an undeceptive nature, which is Nibbana. <coughs> Therefore, a monk possessing this truth possesses the supreme foundation of truth. For this monk is the supreme noble truth, namely Nibbana, which has an undeceptive nature. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he undertook and accepted acquisitions. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made like a palm stump, done, a, done away with them so they're no longer subject to future arising. Therefore, monks possessing this relinquishment possesses the supreme foundation for relinquishment. For this monk is a supreme noble relinquishment, namely the relinquishing of all acquisitions, taking things personally. That's what that means. Formally, when he was ignorant, he experienced covetousness, desire, and lust. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made them like a palm stump, done away with, so that they're no longer subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experiences anger, ill will, and hate. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root. So what we're describing here right now is an anagami or an arahat. 
when they cut it, cut anger off at the root, that means it doesn't arise anymore. Made like a palm stump, done away with so that they're no more subject to future arising. Formerly, when he was ignorant, he experienced ignorance and delusion. What is delusion? A belief in a personal self. Craving. I am. What's ignorance? Seeing and understanding how the Four Noble Truths actually work. And you will see this in every link of dependent origination. This is how it actually works. And you'll be able to see how everything is impermanent suffering and it is impersonal. Now he has abandoned them, cut them off at the root, made like a palm stump done away with them so that they're no longer subject to any future arising. Therefore, a monk possessing this peace possesses the supreme peace. For this monk is the supreme noble peace, namely the pacification of lust, hatred, and delusion. Another way of describing letting go of craving. So it was with reference to this that it was said, one should not neglect wisdom, should preserve truth, should cultivate relinquishment, and should train for peace. The tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him. He is called a sage at peace. So it was said, and with reference to what was this said, I am is conceiving. I am this is conceiving. I shall be is conceiving. I shall not be is conceiving. I shall be possessed of form is conceiving. I shall be formless is conceiving. I shall be radiant is conceiving. I shall be non-radiant and this is conceiving. I shall be neither Radiant nor non-radiant is conceiving. Conceiving is a disease. Conceiving is a tumor. Conceiving is a dart. By overcome all conceivings, monk, one is called a sage at peace. And the sage at peace is not born, does not age, does not die. He is not shaken and does not yearn, for there is nothing present in him by which he might be reborn. Not being born, however, he could age. Not aging, how could he die? Not dying, how could he be shaken? Not being shaken, why should he yearn? So it was with reference to this that it was said, the tides of conceiving do not sweep over one who stands upon these foundations. And when the tides of conceiving no longer sweep over him, he's called a sage at peace. Monk, bear in mind this brief exposition of the six elements. Thereupon the venerable Pukusati thought, Indeed, the teacher has come to me. The sublime one has come to me. The fully awakened one has come to me. Then he rose from his seat, arranged his upper robe over one shoulder and prostrating himself with his head 
at the Blessed One's feet. He said, Venerable Sir, a transgression overcame me, in that, like a fool, confused and blundering, I presumed, I presumed to address the monk as uh, the Blessed One as friend. Venerable Sir, may the Blessed One forgive my transgression, seen as such for the sake of restraint in the future. Surely, monk, a transgression overcame you, in that, like a fool, confused and blundering, you presume to address me as friend. But since you see your transgression as such, and make amends in accordance with the Dhamma, we forgive you, for it is growth in the Noble One's discipline when one sees one's transgression as such, makes amends in accordance with the Dhamma, and undertakes restraint in the future. Venerable Sir, I would receive the full ordination under the Blessed One, but are your bowl and robes complete? Quite often during the time of the Buddha, when he somebody would ask to ordain, because in the past they had donated bowls and robes and food and that sort of thing to Sangha members, the bowl and robe would just appear in front of them. But he wasn't like that. Venerable sir, my bowl and robes are not complete. Monk, Tathagatas do not give the full ordination to anyone whose bowl and robes are not complete. Now it's talking about bowls and robes, but it's also talking about the requisites. Uh, you have to have a razor, you have to have a uh, needle and thread. Um, you have to have a bowl. And you have to have uh, a belt. And I think that's it. So these are things that you have to have because you need a needle, you need thread, you need a razor to shave your head and also to cut any pieces of cloth or whatever. You need to have a, a belt that keeps your under robe from falling off. So those, those are the, the true requisites. These days, they're so common that uh, monks really don't much pay attention. To, oh, there has to be a water filter, too. But mm -hmm. Huh? You could, it could be right. You got it from Thailand? From Thailand? Because it's a Thai bowl? Yeah. What size bowl did you get? Yeah, that's a, that's the size of my bowl. What he what he was using was a nine inch. And those things they they hold so much food. I mean, <laughs> it's just remarkable. <coughs> when the venerable Pukusati, having delighted and rejoiced in the Blessed One's words rose from his seat after paying homage to the Blessed One. He departed in order to search for a bowl and robes. Then, while the venerable Pukusati was searching for a bowl and robes, a stray cow killed him. Then a number of monks went to the Blessed One. After paying homage to him, they sat down on one side and told him, Venerable Sir, the clansman Pukusati, 
who was given brief instruction by the Blessed One has died. What is his destiny? What is his future course? Monks Pukusati, the clansman, or the clansman Pukusati was wise. He practiced in according to the Dhamma and did not trouble me in the interruption of the Dhamma with the destruction of the five lower fetters, the clansman Pukusati has reappeared spontaneously in the pure abode and will attain final Nibbana there without ever returning from that world. That's what the Blessed One said. The monks were satisfied and delighted in the Blessed One's words. So he became an anagami listening to that. It's a good sutta because it does remind you over and over again, this is not me, this is not mine, this I am not. And in another sutta, they, the, the Buddha talks about that as being one of the kind of meditations that you can do and you can get as get to the realm of nothingness. And it's an interesting kind of meditation. One of the advantages of being a monk is you have time to explore a lot of things. You have time to read and study and deeply understand. And some of the practices that I did, I did them for six months just to see what they were. Uh, there's one practice that you only use three postures. You stand, you sit, you walk. You never lie down. And that's a difficult practice. Um, there's three levels of doing it. The first level is sitting out in the middle of the floor. And a lot of the Thai monks would, would do that and then they would start drooping and they, their head would hit the floor and they would be like that for a couple hours and sleeping. And they started hurting their backs a lot. So that's, that's, that's a real difficult practice. The next level of that is sitting in a chair. Or no, uh, not sitting in a chair, leaning against a wall. And that's what I did. I, I leaned against the wall. And I did that for six months. And it is, it's pretty surprising some of the things that you could do when you did that because you had, it took a lot of energy to stay seated and not slip down and lie down. And any time you saw that you were starting to slip, you sat up again. I got so that I started sitting in a corner because that was easier than sitting on a flat wall. Kind of cheated, but yeah. And the, the easiest way is sitting in a chair. Now uh, there is a monk from Burma that as soon, when he ordained, he took a vow that he was only going to use three postures. And I think he was 97 when he died. He had never lied down for 77 years. And he was quite a meditator. He, he was pretty good. A lot of people, they called him an arahat. He wasn't an arahat. Because right near the end of his stay in America, he gave a Dhamma talk saying that he had taken a bodhisattva vow, which means you can't be an arahat if you've taken a bodhisattva vow. <coughs> But there's another practice that I did for, it was about six months, was whatever came up into my mind. Is this me? Is this mine? Who, whose thought is that? 
whose feeling is that? And just did it all day, no matter what I was doing. I would take a look at whatever was coming up so that I could see what it was. Is this me? No, I'm not there. And I got pretty deep into the meditation. So I know that one works. But that was before I found out about craving. So if I were to do that now, what I would do would be with whatever thought arose is, is this me? And then relax. Let go of the craving. So you might be able to go deeper than I did when I did it, but I, I got real deep. And it's quite good. There's there's a lot of there's there's thirteen different practices they call them dudanga practices. Where if you're just a regular monk and you don't do the dudanga practices, you still have two hundred and twenty seven rules you have to follow. But these extra practices are adding a little bit more hardship into things, like. not eating anything that hasn't been put in your bowl. And it was always kind of fun being around monks that did that because, well, because I'm, I'm so big and I'm fair skinned and I'd be in Burma or Thailand, people always gave me extra portions of food. So after I would go out on alms round, I always had enough food for four or five monks. Just, that's just the way it was. And I'd run across a monk that he wouldn't accept any food unless it was put into his bowl and he might not have much food. So I would just start putting stuff in his bowl so he could eat. And that's, that's like one of the ways that monks take care of each other. <coughs> As we give up the home life and give up the family, so when you become a monk, then you have to depend on the Sangha to help you. And it, it's, I, I like doing that. Every now and then I'd run across a monk that needed a massage or whatever, and I get to help him out. I like doing that. It was good fun. So I've been talking for a real long time. Got any questions? Silence. Okay, you ask for it. Now, this is a short exposition on karma, uh, okay, okay, here's some student, some man or woman visits a recluse or brahmin and asks questions. Because of performing and undertaking such action, he reappears in a happy destination. But if instead he comes back to the human state wherever he is reborn, he is very intelligent. And uh, 
he goes to a recluse or a Brahmin and doesn't ask any questions. When he comes back to the human state, wherever he is reborn, he is stupid. <laughs> Your choice. <laughs> yeah. So my bowl, it came with a wet spell. Uh yeah, because it had a straight razor, right? Yeah, that's just it's just uh yeah. But that's not one of the requisites. Because you you can see if you go to Thailand, you'll see people sharpening their their kitchen knives on the on the sidewalk. Any kind of stone will work if it's a hard stone, will work as a, a wet stone. But one of the things that I, I couldn't figure out was why they didn't put a thimble in with the requisites because you, it's hard to push that new needle through some of the stuff you gotta sew. If you don't have a, a thimble, it really hurts. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Right. Oh, not for monks. That's medicine. That's okay. But it, you don't want it smelling. Hmm. Related to his question, what if the intention to help some is what can be open for oil to stand and then go on? Oh, this one smells really nice. I mean, buy. Monks don't buy stuff like that. In Thailand, they have this thing that's like a crystal. You, you run across that, there's no odor at all. So you use, you, the, the monks would use that sort of thing. You don't buy things that are, that are nice smelling. don't obtain, you might obtain things that are nice smelling, but you get rid of them, you give them to somebody else. You really are purifying the body. Even if it's not smelling, you're just trying to make yourself smell nice. Even though it's... Yeah. Yeah. Well, but the 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 thing. Uh, well, chapstick. You put on your lips when your lips get real dry. That's allowable because that's a medicine, but it has lanolin in it, and that's what a lot of lipstick has in it, and that's why women get hooked on lipsticks. can be a lot of psychologists that call themselves uh, what is it cognitive. yeah cognitive psychology 
they don't understand the 12 weeks of dependent origination, not even close. I got, I was interviewed on television in Sri Lanka by this guy that was like a Johnny Carson type of guy. And he was really popular. I mean, everybody watched him. He was on the most popular station and all of that. And he started talking to me about meditation and I started talking a little bit about dependent origination and I saw this extremely blank look in his face. He was a psychologist. And then I started talking to him about how you can develop seeing these kind of things and getting into jhana. And he thought that was a great, a great question. So, yes, I've heard about jhana. How long does it take to get into jhana? I said, one or two days. And his jaw dropped open. Because the Sri Lankan monks, it's 10 years to get into a jhana. And to hear about it in one or two days, I mean, that's just unbelievable. It doesn't take so long if you do it in the right way. But cognitive sciences, a lot of people are doing tests on meditation to see whether the effects of meditation really last as long and are uh, are helpful and they're finding out there's not much difference between one point of concentration or absorption and taking drugs over a long period of time taking drugs for depression or whatever they're, they're finding out there's really not much difference but they're doing one point of concentration and one point of concentration doesn't have personality development. This does. Now, we we're just starting to scratch the surface with some people for the testing. And they're finding out yeah, this is different. It's not like any other kind of cognitive thing that they've ever run across. So their, their machines don't quite know how to analyze it because it is so different because you let go of the craving and you, your mind becomes much quieter, much faster. And it definitely is more fun. Yeah. Feeling and perception are conjoined. Actually, feeling, perception, and consciousness are conjoined. As soon as feeling comes up, perception is there. This is pleasant, this is painful. But it's not a a separate link by itself. Unless you go to some of these people that really don't understand dependent origination and then they like to talk about perception because, well, I can't find it in the, in the text. Well, there's reasons for that. ran across a Dhamma talk by a very well-known meditation teacher, Vipassana teacher, and he started talking about dependent origination and how the links work, and he was one of the most confused people I've run across in a long time. It just doesn't work the way that a lot of people think it, it is supposed to work doesn't. Okay, anything else?
share some merit then. <coughs> May suffering ones be suffering free and the fear struck fearless be. May the grieving shed all grief and may all beings find relief. May all beings share this merit that we've thus acquired for the acquisition of all kinds of happiness. May beings inhabiting space and earth, devas and nagas of mighty power share this merit of ours. May they long protect the Buddha's dispensation. Sound, sound, sound. Thank you.